All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming to the research symposium today. We hope you enjoyed the morning. My name is Nicole Campen. I'm actually the Peoria office person. I'm up visiting for the day. And I am the community development person um, for Central Illinois. And today, for this breakout session, we have Dr. Neil Pliskin, who is a board-certified clinical neurologist and professor of clinical psychiatry and neurology at University of Illinois College of Medicine. He has 25 years of experience working <clears throat> excuse me, as a clinical neuropsychologist and directing clinical neuropsychology training programs. So please welcome Dr. Neil Pliskin. Can you hear me? Okay, good. So one, one uh, correction right off the bat. I am not a neurologist. I'm a neuropsychologist. And I've spent a good portion of my career at the University of Illinois and at the University of Chicago working with people who have multiple sclerosis. And I can say with certainty that many of the patients that I've seen with multiple sclerosis would rather have a lumbar puncture than go through neuropsychological testing. <laughs> that's right. And why is that? And that's because cognition is an area that we take for granted and is an area we become very, very concerned about when we are faced with the challenges of multiple sclerosis. So most of my talk today is going to be about the cognitive changes that can happen to people with multiple sclerosis. And I'm giving you a disclaimer right now. And I'm going to make the same disclaimer at least three more times during this talk. MS is an unpredictable and individual disease. You cannot look at a slide that describes how a large group of people do and see yourself in that because each person has their own individual trajectory. So when I make statements about here's what you see in multiple sclerosis, I'm making general statements that may or may not apply to you. The idea for, for this talk is to heighten your awareness and understanding and to give you if it's relevant for you, some action plans to consider, okay? Any talk about MS and cognition has to start with fatigue because there's a very interesting phenomenon in multiple sclerosis, and that is that you can't tell how much cognitive difficulties somebody's going to have by looking at their MRI scan. The relationship between how someone's MRI looks and the state of their thinking abilities is a weak relationship that has, no, has really not been well understood. I've had many patients who have significant evidence of disease burden on their MRI who have perfectly normal cognition, thinking abilities. And then I have other patients who have very limited evidence of uh, MS lesions who nevertheless are, have significant changes in their thinking. So number of lesions and the way the, M, the way the MRI looks does not tell the full story of who has cognitive impairment and who doesn't, why it occurs, and what you can do about it. And so any talk, any consideration of cognition has to always take into account the role of fatigue in patients with MS. When I do my neuropsychological evaluations, unlike many colleagues I know, I have my MS patients come and spend the good part of a day with me. If they have to, to take a rest or a nap, that's fine. But I'm interested in knowing how people perform at the beginning of the day versus how people perform at the end of the day. Because someone can be extremely sharp at one point in time during the day and have extremely slowed thinking and concentration problems later on in that same day. Why? 
in part because the role that fatigue plays in cognitive performance. And this is a research symposium, so I'm throwing in some research. And when you look at the earliest MS-related symptoms, the, in a large sample of almost 500 people, the first symptom that people had was fatigue, fatigue with something else, or fatigue. Close to 30 to 40 percent of people experience that right off the bat. And when you look at what are the factors that contribute to whether someone's able to maintain their job or not, well, over time, one reason is the emergence of cognitive difficulties, and the other reason is the highly significant, significant effects of fatigue. I'm a neuropsychologist. There's a psychological role that's, that we all have when it comes to ourselves, our thinking abilities, our emotional experiences. MS, um, in some individuals, causes changes in emotions. In other individuals, it's in reaction to getting MS that there's a change in emotions. The cognitive difficulties that you see in multiple sclerosis for those people who have them, and it won't be everybody, those people, they're having those problems not because of emotional difficulties. Cognitive changes occur as a function of the disease process. Emotional changes occur as a function of the disease process. Emotional changes don't typically cause cognitive changes in people with MS. It just makes cognitive changes worse. If you're already having problems with concentration and your distress level is high, your concentration is going to be worse. You don't need a stinking neuropsychologist or a neurologist to tell you that. So the rest of this talk is going to focus on cognitive changes. And there's a range of cognitive changes that I'm going to talk about, but the most common one that I hear from people is memory and concentration. So let's, these are the relevant questions I'm going to try to address in the time that I have left. One is, how often do these cognitive changes occur in people with MS? What cognitive abilities are affected? What happens to MS-related cognitive problems over time? And are there treatments that really help? So let's turn to the first question. When you take people who are residing in the community as opposed to grabbing a group of people who are in clinic waiting to be seen, some of whom may not be residing in the community, the prevalence rates of cognitive impairment and multiple sclerosis range from 40% to 65%. Worded another way, that means that anywhere between 35 and 60% of people won't have cognitive impairment. It's probably true that people who have the chronic progressive form or, the sec or in the secondary progressive stage of their disease are more likely to have cognitive impairment, although that's not a consistent finding. But what we do know is that cognitive abilities are absolutely essential to independent living and self-esteem. And so, what cognitive abilities are affected? The most honest answer is it varies from person to person. Most of the studies that have been done have looked at people who have already had MS for, for a few years. And in those studies, areas that were affected in some patients were memory and the ability to learn new information, meaning that they were slower at learning new information. We're not talking about Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is abnormally rapid forgetting of information. In studies of people with, with MS who have memory problems, it's more like it's harder for the information to stick. But once it sticks, 
it's in there. And there's not the rapid forgetting. So when we talk about memory problems in MS, we're making a very big distinction between that and Alzheimer's disease. They're nothing alike. Some patients have things, executive deficits and visual spatial deficits, which I'm going to define for you. But these are the core changes that some of you or some of your loved ones may have. For those that do, slowed thinking speed is a very common finding. So you're in a room and there's two conversations going on at once, tracking both of those conversations simultaneously becomes a challenge. Have three things going on at one time, forget about it. I think I've just said this, but I'll say again, memory retrieval problems. So this isn't forgetting. This is, it's in there, ah, oh, I know what I want to say, oh, I, I know it's in there, just can't get it out. The way I like to think about it is like, if, if, your, if your memories are like books on the shelf in a library, if you have MS and you have symptomatic cognitive problems, it's like having a key to the front door of the library that's worn down. So you're sticking it in there and you're jiggling it, you're jiggling it, you can't get it open. But when you get that door open, all the books are still on the shelf. And that's what it's like for, for people with MS. It's harder to concentrate. And then you throw in the fatigue factor and concentration is very difficult. I've worked with patients who have had very understanding employers where at once or twice during the work day, they've gone and they've allowed them to lay down for a half hour and they've continued to be very productive. Other people I know have had situations with employers where later in the day or at other times when their disease is more active, they start making mistakes and there's a lot of extra pressure and stress. Commonly what I hear my patients say to me is everything that used to be automatic, I never had to think about it, I just did it. Now it takes more effort, it takes more focus for me to be able to do the things that I could do. Why does it happen? Well, I've already talked about this and I'm going to just say a couple of more things about it because I have some newer research that I still want to show you. So more active disease is one reason why people get cognitive impairment. But it's not the only reason. It's the immune system response to having active disease that produces proteins in the brain that make people have, feel sluggish, not feel well, have concentration problems. Throw into that a good dose of stress and emotional difficulties at home, at work, personally having to adjust to your life being turned completely upside down, and that presents a complex brew that leads to people having cognitive difficulties. And if you don't have a good understanding of those cognitive difficulties, you start fearing the worst, you start testing yourself so that every word that comes out of your mouth, you start listening. Am I making a mistake? Am I going to make a mistake? Am I going to be embarrassed? which then further takes away from concentration and makes it harder for people to, to function automatically. And then something I'm going to talk about is the role of cognitive reserve. Part of, it's part of what you bring in to the situation dictates how MS ends up affecting you. So in short, cognitive changes in MS, no two people are alike. Changes, they can occur early, they can occur late, they can occur not at all. There's no one-to-one -one relationship between cognitive impairment and age or how disabled you are motorically. I have many a patient who have significant motoric disability who are sharp as a tack cognitively. And course and duration of illness. So when we talk about slowed reaction time, we're talking about behind the wheel when driving, trouble keeping up with conversations, doing more than one thing at a time, 
for sustained concentration, reading a book, new information that doesn't stick as effectively as, as it used to. Can only focus on one thing at a time, and if you try to do that, otherwise you lose track. Some physicians like to prescribe psychostimulants for their patients who are having concentration problems. I've already talked about the memory retrieval, the tip of the tongue, the I got the key to get into the library, why won't that door open? And familiar versus unfamiliar. By that I mean when you're in your comfort zone, doing your normal everyday activities and routine, having slower thinking or having concentration problems will not have a significant life impact. Even though you'll know that it, you're different, it's, it's not necessarily going to be life-changing. But when you go into unfamiliar situations, situations that require new learning, judgment, decision-making, problem-solving, you got to give yourself more time to do it. It's not that you can't do it. It's just that it takes longer. And, of course, loved ones who have come to know you and appreciate you in a certain way may not fully understand that. So they'll finish your sentences. They'll want to help, and they'll do some of your thinking for you. And then there's this issue of executive functioning, which is a broad term that you'll hear sometimes to mean things like the ability to stay organized and to plan ahead, to pay attention to yourself and how you're coming across to other people, to thinking about more than one thing at a time, to think before you act, to use judgment and reasoning. Now, again, what you bring in also influences the kind of person that you are. So I may be describing characteristics of your personality that have nothing to do with MS. All right, I'm skipping all the show and tell because I'm only short on time. And I, I really, there's something very important I want to talk to you about still. And that is this question. What happens to MS-related cognitive problems over time? That's my question that I get asked a lot. I'm sorry about all the heavy-duty writing here. I'm just going to summarize a few things for you. And that is when you look at studies of people who are eight years out and you look at study of, studies of people who are ten years out, they would suggest that around 60% of people end up developing more cognitive impairment over time. But I'm not going to end on that note because I have newer information for you. Years ago, when I was at the University of Chicago, I had the pleasure of working with the University of Chicago MS team during the pivotal trial of interferon beta. And Barry Arneson at that time asked me to come in and do some cognitive testing for people who had already been in the pivotal trial for two years. And I did. And eventually, when the trial was over, it was determined that we had, some of our patients had, were in the high-dose group, some were in the low-dose group, and about half were in the placebo group. And what we reported back in 1996 was that when you tested people who, were, who had been on interferon beta, a beta-1b, that their cognitive performance stayed the same or improved, and that that was related to evidence of decreased disease burden on MRI. Well, I've since moved, and that was a very important finding for us. I since moved on to the University of Illinois, but a couple of my former students stayed behind at the University of Chicago, and along with Dr. Reeder, earlier this year, over the last year, captured a group of those people that we had, had tested. For all I know, it may be one or two of you in the room here. 
from that original 1996 study and gave them the same round of testing 16 years later. This is not even out yet. This is in press in the Multiple Sclerosis Journal. It'll be out in the next probably two months. And the study was conducted largely by my colleague Maureen Lacey. And here is the take-home message. And I've got to walk you through some of this, but it's important. On the left side is, whoa, how did that happen? There we go. On the left side, this axis here is change in cognitive performance. So any score lower than um, here is considered significant. So what that means is I could test you one day and I could test you again the next day and if you got anywhere between here and here, it would just be considered a minimal change. 16 years later, our group of patients who had been on beta seron, the high dose group, and the low dose group, 16 years later, tested with the same battery of tests, showed no decline in cognition. And in fact, in some areas related to speed of processing, performance better. This is the slide I want to show you. <clears throat> Originally, a group of our patients 16 years ago were on placebo. At the end of the study, <coughs> sorry, they switched to high-dose interferon. This is that group 16 years later. And you'll note that the same gains in speed and visual memory identified in the group overall are present here also. But this group had what looked to be close to some visual, verbal memory impairment. So the idea was the people who had been on the beta seron longer had less cognitive impairment than the people who had been on the high dose beta seron from the beginning of the study, and nobody in the study 16 years later, pretty much consistently on um, biologic treatment, showed a decline in their cognition. So for those people who are having cognitive impairment, what are the treatments? What are the things that help? What matters? Well, to date, the research on cognitive rehabilitation and MS has not been very promising. And right now, I can hear the questions formulating before you can even think them. What about Lumosity? What about some of the other online programs? Will they make a difference? Do they make a difference? The evidence is mixed. So why do individuals become cognitively impaired and why do others not become cognitively impaired? And the, the big reason is, I'm sorry to flash so many slides your way, but I want to hit you with my main points. What you bring to the dance dictates how the dance goes. Those of you that have higher education, those of you that have higher intelligence, those of you that have done a lot of reading, those of you that have been intellectually active so that you have built up a large network of connections between brain cells mitigates, influences how rapidly disease burden affects you. And the reason that I tell you this, not only as, as a way of looking backwards, but the, the idea here is one of what's called cognitive reserve. What you do now matters down the road how it's going to affect you, whether it's MS or any other condition, including aging. So the higher the intellectual enrichment, enrichment than someone has, 
the more that it decreases the risk of certain kinds of cognitive impairment. MS patients who engaged in more early life cognitive leisure, how are we going to define that? Reading books, reading magazines, producing art, non-artistic writing, playing a musical instrument, playing structured games, yes, even on the computer. Participate in hobbies. That engaging in that level of early life leisure that those MS patients evidence better cognitive status and were more able to withstand the severe effects of the MS that affected some of the people in that group. Life experiences matter. They matter now. So what does it mean? It means that rehabilitation techniques designed to improve memory and thinking abilities, that's one way to enhance what you're doing. But another way is to not wait. If you feel that you have cognitive impairment, get a neuropsychological evaluation, ask your qualified health care provider about that. If that isn't an issue for you, now's the time to be intellectually as active and as enriched as you can. And that doesn't mean testing yourself. That means getting strategies in place. So let's say that you're one of the people who has multiple sclerosis who doesn't have significant cognitive impairment or the cognitive impairment hasn't caused significant ripples in your ability to do what you need to do in your life. Well, first of all, you're blessed and fortunate. Secondly, that means that now's the time to get your compensatory strategies in place. Even if you don't feel like you need to use your iPhone, your iPad, I'll date myself, your Palm Pilot, <laughs> or a good old-fashioned notebook. I don't need that now. Well, the more that you can get compensatory strategies and associated strategies in place to help you, even if you don't need it now, it'll make it easier down the road if you're one of that 40 to 60 percent of people with MS who develops cognitive impairment. Learn and integrate these strategies into daily routines before memory decline makes such challenging and integration of activities and, and mental activities more challenging. And then finally, how to live a brain healthy lifestyle. To the extent that your physician allows physical activity. You know, I'm, uh, I see MS patients, but I also see many, many other kinds of individuals with different conditions in my practice. And you know, the question I'm always asked is, well, what can I do to keep from losing it? And, you know, the studies keep coming back to, again and again, the role that physical exercise plays in enhancing cognition. Sleep is huge. You don't sleep well. You're getting up three or four times. You snore. You're an active dreamer any of those things that disrupt the way that you're able to sleep or that your bed partner is able to sleep has a huge impact on cognition. Now you want to talk about fatigue. Now let's talk about fatigue plus daytime sleepiness associated with low quality sleep. How's that going to affect cognition? It will. And then adherence to prescribed disease modifying therapies. I don't have any disclosures, I don't work for any drug companies, but I've been involved in at least one study with a disease-modifying therapy that has shown that in 16 years, people who took it consistently did not show evidence of decline on cognitive testing. And to me, that's really important information to share with you. So getting around the problem, if you have it, note-taking and list-making. They have these wonderful little digital pocket recorders now if, you don't, if you're not iPhone friendly where you could be sitting in a talk like this 
You could have that digital recorder going. You could upload it to your computer. And you could listen as many times as you needed to. Caregivers of individuals who have cognitive impairment, I'll just say this to you. It's not their fault. They don't choose to be that way. And you have to be patient. And sometimes being patient means not doing it for them. Because self-esteem and independence is so central to the way that many people feel about themselves. That made no sense, of course. Self-esteem is how you feel about yourself. Independence is so important. Okay, so in conclusion, cognitive changes do happen in people with MS, even in the early phases. It doesn't happen to everybody. And what dictates who gets cognitive impairment and how much cognitive impairment there is is not easily characterized. It's not just how disabled somebody is. It's not just how many lesions they have on their MRI scan. Sometimes it has to do with how much someone brings into the equation. If you've had a long history, for example, of drinking alcohol, and then you get multiple sclerosis, or you've had a head injury, and then you get multiple sclerosis. Anything that affects your cognitive reserve can lead to an increased expression of these kinds of symptoms. Conversely, building up cognitive reserve, fighting through the depression, and remaining active, intellectually stimulated, involved in life. That builds cognitive reserve. And that helps you. And that can be done on Lumosity too. Or anything. Xbox. Watching a play. Okay. At this point I'll stop and I'll see if there's any questions. Yes, sir. Oh. Originally, the question was how many patients? And originally, originally there were, um, I want to say, 16 people in, in that study. So it's a small sample, but it was a robust finding, peer reviewed. Yes. Beta serum. I told you I'm a neuropsychologist. I'm not a neurologist. I'm not sure which form it is. In our study, it was just the one B. Yes. Okay. I'll be, I'll tell you what. I'll repeat the questions. Okay. The question was was it or that you can use the mic. Is it inter was it interferon beta 1A or 1B? In our study, it was interferon 1B. Okay, I'll work the way through the for questions. Go ahead. Oh, and we have a microphone too. There you go. You said that everybody is different in their cognitive problems. Everything you had up there is exactly what I have. So, is that normal? That I would have everything? Well, yes. If you have multiple sclerosis that produces cognitive difficulties, then it would not be at all unusual for you to have that range of cognitive difficulties. If you can't concentrate, thinking is more slow. If you can't concentrate and you're fatigued, you're going to miss information that's happening around you. So, Yes, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's perfectly normal or abnormal. It's common. Okay, let's work our way. Here we go. Yes. Sorry. I got the microphone. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, you got him? All right. 
I gave a presentation last night to the MS group facilitators about exercising the brain. Um, I, I mentioned Lumosity because I use that and I find that very effective. Can Cardi people hear? No. You got to go right up to them. All right. Can you hear me now? <laughs> um, I gave the presentation to the MS facilitators last night about exercising the brain. I mentioned Lumosity. I mentioned card games, uh, different games, superplexus, anything that, that stimulates the brain, including laughing. And I think that's very important for people with MS to exercise their brain, but also exercise the body along with that. Because I, when you were going through your slides, I saw several of the cognitive tests that I've done at the University of Illinois. And I find that I'm better at those after I exercise. And if I physically exercise, my brain is sharper. Thank so you for the reinforcing that. Hand hand. All right, we got a question here, and then we'll go here. Oh. Go ahead. I used to be an avid reader. Um, I would read three or four books a week. And I used to do the uh, speed read. It takes me now, if I read something, I have to read it three or four times word for word in order to absorb everything that it's saying. And it's really made it hard because it takes me so much longer. Um, you know, I, I've got a master's in journalism. I've got three masters. And um, what I'm trying to do every day is I do the word find, and I can look at the page, and then... After about five minutes or so, I can actually see where the words are, and I can start circling them. But I notice that that has helped a lot, but still it takes me a while in order to absorb everything that I'm reading. Is that common? Okay. Uh, yes, it's common, and you, you've said two things that I really want to reinforce. One is it does make sense for you, even if it's laborious and non-automatic, it does make sense for you to continue to plow through with doing some reading, okay? But the other part of it is if, if you want to also use it as a source of enjoyment and information, I don't think there's anything wrong with switching to audiobooks and audible.com or, or anything else like that. So what I would say is keep reading, but also if part of it is this is a way that you can relax and get enjoyment or st stimulation, consider then less laborious ways of acquiring that information. Right. It's fatigue plays that huge role. So passively listening versus actively reading is a distinction that you can make here so that maybe you divide it up so that you're doing a little bit of both. There's a question here. You're welcome. And kind of comments, too. We have to work at learning and learn how we learn so we can retain things. I have um, realized that I need to hear things, I need to see things, and then I need to have the motor skill of trying to write it down, whether I can read it or not. And, that, and, and just working in it and learning how to help yourself. You said that so well, by, by reading, by looking, by writing, you've now exposed it three different ways, three different modalities, three different rehearsals. You can't do that with everything in life, but the important things, that's a really good strategy. I know there was a question over here, yes. Hi, sir, I quit smoking two years ago. I lost all, thank you, but that's not why. It's hard for me to concentrate on things now, to sit still without wanting something to eat or whatever. I'm 56 years old, a lot of senior moments. I've had MS for 10 years. Does it matter what is con it is that's giving me the cognitive problems? Is there a difference? Does that make a difference, or is it just that these things that help any of them would work? Oh, I, I, you can have it. 
I definitely think it matters because, and this is where getting a neuropsychological evaluation is important, because cognitive changes associated with MS are different than cognitive changes associated with age, are different from cognitive changes associated with sleepiness or being overly sedated with medicines. So what I would say is you want to first clarify to the fullest extent that you can what the different components of your cognitive difficulties are. Are there any components that are more treatable? I mentioned in my talk, for example, that some of my neurologist colleagues will, if it's safe, they'll prescribe uh, like mild stimulant medication to help people but with their concentration and focus. But part of it is you have to understand first, is this a primarily an MS-related problem? Is this MS plus aging or anything else that before you, you have to understand it as well as you can as you implement these strategies and these compensation techniques to get around them? You're welcome. We've got a mic over here okay, go. Whoever's got a microphone. Um, I would th can you hear me? Yeah. I would think that having like a baseline uh, neuropsych evaluation and then having some periodic retesting over time would be very helpful um, to see the differences and then the decline in cognition that's occurring. Do you know through your practice or could you, could you say um, how difficult it is to get insurance companies to cooperate with the payment for those, um, you know, just because you want to have that information? Well, I think that it goes better if you say that you want to have that information because in part you're experiencing some glitches or changes or concerns about your memory, whatever you want to call it. I think that some insurance companies will pay for that and some won't. You're going to have to call and find out. Um, it's really not a bad idea. but. Um, yeah, I mean, there's more I could say, but not publicly. So <laughs> I just. Okay, who else has a mic? I have a mic. All right. Right here. Go. Okay, I have two quick questions. Um, one, I going tagging along, piggybacking on that baseline. My baseline from way back um, is much better. So I've had a lot of cognitive difficulties recently, but compared to, I think because I'm coming from where I used to have almost photo, photographic memory where I could see what I read on pages. Now that doesn't happen anymore. Um, my, my processing has slowed down quite a bit, understanding things. It takes me just a little longer. I have to work on concentrating. Um, so my question is, I'm having to prove that now, and I saw in your presentation where you said that there are some studies where there's a difference in, in the matter on the brain that sh can show that. Where can I get that information? Because I need to prove that now, and, and I have a neurologist that's not very helpful. What do you need to prove? Um, that there's a change, that I'm, I've experienced change. Have you had a neuropsychological evaluation before? I did years ago. Well, you, that, I couldn't imagine a better scenario for you because if you have access to that old neuropsychological evaluation mm -hmm. and now you take it to a new neuropsychologist or even better yet, that other neuropsychologist and have them redo the evaluation, now you have an objective set of scores from back in the day and now there's no better way to demonstrate that there's been a change than by actually having the objective scores to compare from one evaluation to the next. That one from years ago would serve as your baseline evaluation. Well, not necessarily, because the one from years ago, I had already started having these difficulties. So, but I don't know. Nevertheless, um, you it, think it still helped? could. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I forgot my second question. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I, I, had a, I had another question. I, can't I, I didn't answer right your now. first question, really, but I think that the best <laughs> answer I can give you is mm -hmm. if you come and you see a neuropsychologist and you lay out the scenario, I'm quite sure that there would be options that would be there for you. Mm -hmm. Taking a picture of your brain now, if there was an old picture of your brain, might be informative. 
but you've heard me just spend the last 45 minutes talking saying that the picture doesn't tell the full story. So for you, you could have that picture and it still may not be what you need. So uh, I just encourage question. you to talk to a neuropsychologist. Okay, yeah, because that was the question. I, um, my MRIs are not showing any of that, so I need to see a, neuro a neuropsychologist, you think? If the concern that you have relates to the quality of your thinking abilities, then the answer is yes. If the question is, do I have MS or do I not have MS, no. then a neurologist would be your, your No, your best this person. is all for um, insurance reasons. Why don't you just come and talk to me after this presentation, and, okay. I'll, and I'll be more specific. <laughs> okay, go. Uh, I have a question. Uh, because uh, I know on my example that there are problems with going from short-term memory to long term. For example, if I hear weather forecast in the news, I uh, forget it in a couple minutes. It doesn't stick. Yeah. Are, are there any ways to facilitate that transition from short term memory to long term? Yes. Most involve effort. And by that I mean you're used to hearing something one time and it just automatically being there. And with MS, this was what I was talking about before when I said you can hear it or you can see it and it doesn't necessarily stick, especially if you hear it or see it one time. So you really got to know what the weather is the next day. You watch the weather report, you write down the relevant information or you say it back to yourself a second or a third time or you have someone next to you repeat it to you because the unfortunate reality is that in order to get information to stick from short to longer term it takes more work and more effort on your part now for that to happen it's not automatic anymore so I know that's not a satisfying answer but it's an honest answer if there's things that you want to remember then doing it the old way just doesn't work anymore. So it's writing things down. It's making tape recordings or, or having your iPhone going. It's watching something more than once. So. Dr. Pliskin. Yes. If you're dealing with someone who has obvious um, impairment issues, they choose not to recognize that they have it. It's maybe more of a psychological question. Am I better off in associating it if I go with this charade, they've convinced themselves they don't have it, or to encourage them to seek help when I know that frustrates them? It's kind of a lose-lose situation. Well, and also add on to part three of that is that someone may not appreciate the changes that they're experiencing because that's a function of their disease process. There are certain kinds of uh, brain dysfunction that occurs that cause disorders of awareness. So you can confront such a person with information right up to their face and they just don't appreciate it. it. As opposed to the person where it's too painful to look at it, I don't want to talk about it, you don't know what you're talking about, I never want to have that discussion again, where it's clear that there's more emotional adjustment factors, then that person obviously needs your help and support um, and encouragement and empowerment to, that's fine, then go and get this testing done to support your position that you don't have any difficulties. But it's that distinction between psychological defensiveness of this is just too much for me to look at. You don't know what you're talking about, fight back, push back, versus I don't have that problem. Obviously, and I'm not qualified to make that, so. You're, well, you're, if you're talking about a family member or a loved one, you're more qualified than I am. Go with them well, the to question the doctor. Right here in the back. Okay, are we sans microphone? Oh, right here. I, I, have, I have two questions. 
Uh, my one question for you is um, when you talked about the 16-year drug uh, study and the, imp and the impact on cognitive for the interferon B, so what, what do you think caused uh, the, uh, the, the cognitive ability to not diminish? Was it the drug or was it something else? Uh, I suspect, you know, again, I'm not the right person to answer that, but here's my, my almost layperson's answer. I think it has to do with decreased inflammation. I think that there are ample studies that show that inflammation in the brain, not just secondary to MS, but other neuroimmunological conditions, is destructive. Mm -hmm. So if, if, the, if that form of treatment is modifying the expression of the disease so there's not as many exacerbations and not as much inflammation, then it makes sense that there would be more stability in thinking abilities. And my second part of that then is, what about then the other drugs that are on the market, and are there any tests that they're doing to check, or to, you know, like Tysabri or anything else? You know, if you speak to the folks at the MS Society, I'm sure that they probably have a registry of those kinds of studies that are going on. Ours was just serendipitous because it was Dr. Arneson saying, hey, come and see these patients, because in the original pivotal study, there were no cognitive tests. And so we just slipped in and did some. And then we were able to get the same folks to come back 16 years later. So I don't think you, you could design that study and make it work. So I, but I would check with the MS Society is definitely the best resource because I know they fund those studies and they're involved in them. I'll keep going here, but I was told that I had until 220. All right, Hi. here we go. So um, I have a mess. I'm a researcher two at the University of Chicago, and I'm, I'm a little bit frightened, but I had a couple episodes where I'll, um, I'll be in the middle of a, of a thought, like say I need to leave early and I need to go pick up something for my dog from PetSmart. Somebody will ask me as I'm walking out, oh, are you leaving early? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to. And it's almost like it's trying to download. I know what I'm trying to say, and it's a complete blink. And I'm getting frustrated because I'm waiting for it to come up, and it's like it's taking all day, and I'm like frightened because I'm a researcher. And the last thing you want to do is not be able to retain information or when you're doing your experiment. So let me ask you a question. Did it ever come back to you where you were headed out the door, where you were going? Yeah, I, knew where I, was. I knew where I was going. I couldn't say it, though. I couldn't. But like, you knew where you were going? Yeah. So it didn't stop you from getting to where you needed to go? No. Even though it, it frustrated the hell out of you that you couldn't produce it on command. Right. Right. Welcome to the world of MS. <laughs> I don't, and I don't mean to be flippant. No, I mean, that no, is exactly no, what happens. Okay. And the, the good part of the story is that it didn't stop you from getting to where you wanted to go. Right. And so part of it, and part of it is you have this major reaction to, uh, holy cow, this is a huge change. This shouldn't be happening. Right. Like, why can't I say it? Why can't I say right. it? And, and when I talk, was talking earlier and I said, everything that you do, it can't be a self-evaluation. Okay. You're a poster child for that. Okay. Because it can't be, oh, I can't remember that. Oh, and then go off into directions of my MS must be getting worse. I must be damaged goods. I'm losing it. Whatever it is then just adds stress, adds distraction, and adds more burden to trying to jiggle that key to get that front door open. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to know if a person comes to a doctor like you and does all the testing, what are you going to do for them? <sighs> In other words... Is, it gonna, am I, is what I'm going to do going to make a difference in what's going to happen with you? <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm a Ph.D. and I'm not an M.D., so I might say certain kinds of medication might be something that you and your doctor should consider, but it would be, that would be beyond what is my scope of practice, so I would not be the one to, no. no what I would be do, what I would, here's what I would be doing as a neuropsychologist. I'd be evaluating your thinking abilities to see what things you did well and what you had difficulty with. The things that you had difficulty with, I would look to see if there are ways to get around 
those difficulties. If you are having difficulties, I would look to see if they're potentially due to other causes or other additive factors. But at the end of the day, the neuropsychological evaluation is going to be more about giving you information about your condition and maybe giving you some tools and different ways to think about how to approach living with the disease. Yeah. Dr. Pliskin, um, do you have a printout of your presentation? Um, I'm going to give you, um, no and no, I don't, but I'll, I'll give you my email address, and if you want to get a copy of it, I'll email it right back to you. Oh, yeah. never it mind. The, the recording has been posted on the web. Post Maybe you should make the announcement. Recordings of these sessions will be posted on our website in a few days. <laughs> and we... Here's my email address. I don't care. <clears throat> Just don't email me in the middle of the night. N Pliskin, N P L I, I'm joking about that too, you could. N P L I S K I N at U I C dot E D U. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. Looks like I'm out of time, but I've got one person right in front of me and another person with a mic, so these will be the last two questions. No mic, go first. Okay, I have a big, large voice. Um, I found that you have to laugh at MS throughout the disease process. You have to have a sense of humor. I call them brain farts. Instead of getting frustrated, it's just your mind trying to find a different path. So laugh at it. I call them glitches. Okay, very nice. Okay, what about something that you, it's not slow retrieval, it's something else. It's, it's knowing if I'm in a conversation with someone and my mind says, no, that's not what I meant, for instance. And it will not come out of my mouth. So the wrong thing comes out of your mouth or nothing comes out? Nothing comes out. I can not respond a timely way. And if you had enough time, could you respond? It more likely is much later or the next day before I can really make a response. So that's, that's a combination of slowness and problems with spontaneously retrieving information on command at an extreme level. And that's how you're describing it. Yeah, it, it's problems with automatically being able to pull things right out of your, you know, your thought process. Well, thank you for your attention and thank you for your questions.